In Calculus 1, I talked about the elementary functions. This was the class of typical functions, the familiar functions that are most useful. It included polynomials, roots, exponentials, logarithms, and trigonometry. However, there is one type of function that is normally part of the class of elementary functions that I didn't talk about in Calculus 1. This is the class of hyperbolic functions, and I'll spend this video introducing this new type of function. The hyperbolics are a parallel construction to the trig functions. So, to understand the hyperbolics, I need to review trig. The trig functions are based on the unit circle. So, here is the unit circle. Consider a point on the edge of the circle. That point can be defined based on angle, which is measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. But how is angle defined? Degree definitions are arbitrary, just some fraction of 360 degrees around the circle. But radian angles are defined intrinsically, which is why they are preferred in most of mathematics. For a unit circle, the angle in radians is defined to be the length of the arc up to the point. Arc length is angle. And this is why 2 pi radians is a full circle. The circumference of the circle is 2 pi units of distance, so a full angle is 2 pi radians. Equivalently, I could define angle in terms of area. Since the area of the whole unit circle is pi r squared, but r is 1, that means the area of the whole unit circle is pi units of distance squared. Well, this is one half of the arc length, which is 2 pi all the way around, so the area is one half of the angle in radians. The point in all of this is that the angle is intrinsic. It's either defined as the arc length or twice the area measured counterclockwise from the positive x-axis. Then, once I know the angle, I can ask for the x and y coordinates of a point on the circle. The x coordinate is some function of the angle, and the y coordinate is some other function of the angle. These are the trig functions by definition. Cosine is the x-coordinate of a point on the unit circle depending on angle, and sine is the y-coordinate likewise. As the point goes around the circle, the coordinates oscillate. The x-coordinate starts at 1, decreases to negative 1, and then grows again to 1. This is the cosine wave. The y-coordinate starts at 0, grows to 1, decreases to negative 1, and then back up to 0. And this is the sine wave. Every 2 pi they repeat, because every 2 pi, I go around the whole circle. Everything about the trig functions is based on this circle definition. All the properties, all the identities, everything. In particular, the equation of the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. Well, if x is sine theta and y is cosine theta, then sine squared plus cos squared equals 1, which is the most basic of the trig identities. This identity recovers the fact that this is all based on the unit circle. Okay, that's a review of how the trig functions are defined and how they relate to the circle, which is their source. Now I'm going to change just one thing. Instead of starting with the circle x squared plus y squared equals 1, I'll start with the shape x squared minus y squared equals 1. Just one sign change. Then I'll repeat the same construction, define angle, define coordinates based on angle. And this is how the hyperbolic functions are defined, in direct parallel to trig, but with a different starting shape. x squared minus y squared equals 1 is the unit hyperbola. Unlike the circle, it is an unbounded shape. It extends off to infinity. However, I can still do the same setup. I consider a point on the positive half of the hyperbola. I define the angle up from the positive x-axis. This angle will be equal to the area inscribed. And this is slightly different since it was twice the area for the circle, but this is the setup that does give you the parallel structure. Then, as the point gets farther up the hyperbola, the angle grows. The bottom half of the hyperbola is given by negative angle below the x-axis. So now I have a new notion of angle. This is called hyperbolic angle. Then, based on this hyperbolic angle, I can define the hyperbolic functions. Hyperbolic cosine, pronounced cosh, is the x-coordinate of the point as a function of the angle, and hyperbolic sine, pronounced shine, is the y-coordinate. Then let me go back to the comparison. 
The basic identity for trig was sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 because the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. The basic identity for the hyperbolics is sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 because the unit hyperbola is x squared minus y squared equals 1. Now that I have hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine, I can define the other hyperbolics just like trig. Hyperbolic tangent is shine over cosh. Hyperbolic secant is the reciprocal of cosh. For almost every trig identity, there is a matching hyperbolic identity. For example, the sum identity for hyperbolic sine is shine x plus y equals shine x cosh y plus cosh x shine y. There are square identities, like the hyperbolic tangent squared equals 1 micro minus hyperbolic secant squared. These identities are all listed in the reference material. Now, however, there is something new. Even though the hyperbolics are defined in parallel with trig, they also have a strong relationship with exponentials. For reasons that I won't prove in this video, the hyperbolics are nothing more than the sums and differences of exponentials. Cosh is e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2, and shine is the same thing with the subtraction. And this is quite surprising. There was nothing particularly exponential about the definition. The hyperbola and its angle don't look like exponential functions. But the relationship is there. This slide shows how the other hyperbolics are also defined by exponentials. I can invert this relationship as well. Here again are the hyperbolics in terms of the exponentials. But if I add shine and cosh together, the e to the negative x terms cancel, and then e to the positive x terms add up. So I get exactly e to the x. The exponential itself is just the sum of the two hyperbolics. I'll return to this identity much later in the course, when infinite series are going to give extra insights into what is going on here. But before finishing the video, I want to leave you with an important question, one that we'll again have to wait for infinite series to answer. There is a relationship between hyperbolics and trig. They have a parallel construction, similar names, very similar identities. There is a relationship between hyperbolics and exponentials, as I've just shown. What is the third side of this triangle? What is the relationship between trig and exponentials? Well, it turns out there is a deep and important relationship between trig and exponentials, and happily, I'll be able to share that with you before the end of the course.